Okay, these sessions, uh, today we're going to have three sessions, the three first sessions, and we're going to get uh, to know JavaScript from the ground up. Um, this is actually a copy of a course that I've given in this academy, but in the other hall about two years ago. <coughs> and I've transcribed everything to KPMG teams, as you can see. Uh, but most of the stuff and the demos that I'm going to show you are the same. On top of that, there are a lot of extra demos. Most of what I'm going to do is stand here and give demos. And you guys have, some of you have computers, you can try them, you can play with them. We're going to try to debug. Maybe something I'm saying is not right. You can check, check, it, check this out. We can also experiment ourselves. I think that's a big part of learning. Um, um, so we're going to take it really from, from the first steps of introducing JavaScript. And we're going to go all the way to uh, object-oriented and object and inheritance and how it works in JavaScript and how to build, uh, mm, how to interact with the, with the browser objects and how to build with jQuery and stuff. It's not going to be complete about a complete full course of all the internals possible of JavaScript, but I, I think that it should give a boost to whoever wants to get started with it. And I'm going to try to explain things my way, which means sometimes making jokes and sometimes not. But I, I'll try to make things as clear as possible for people who are not coming from this field, because <coughs> not everybody here is a developer. And some things are more clear and more intuitive for people who wrote in other languages. Um, by the way, I'm using my home computer this time for a few reasons. First of all, to the KPMG laptop, I couldn't plug my wireless microphone because it only connects to a headset and I couldn't get it plugged working right. Maybe next time. And uh, the second reason is that on my home laptop, I can demonstrate much more things that I'm limited to do in my KPMG laptop. And I think that's also valuable because we'll get to see a few things that you cannot do in your KPMG laptops. So let's start with an introduction. By the way, feel free to stop me and ask questions, and I'll try to answer them at any point. So JavaScript. Yes. Um, people say that the connection between um, Java <coughs> and JavaScript is pretty much be like between car and carpet, it's, uh, or like ham and hamster. They are completely, completely unrelated, despite the, the similarity in the names. Yep. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the history and how this thing be became and what it is and why is it called JavaScript. But uh, first, let's start with what we can do and achieve with JavaScript. We're mostly talking about dynamic HTML. We, uh, JavaScript is becoming crazy. Uh, popular in going to be on on every mobile device. It's uh, building some mobile applications with with or without a uh, website, and it's pretty much becoming the most popular programming language right now. Um, it has a lot of um, how to say um, extensions, libraries, frameworks, and also other languages which are uh, what do you call it when a TV series finishes and then you have an another TV series based on the first one. I forgot what's, what's it called. Uh, but there are other languages now based on JavaScript, like TypeScript, which are actually ex extending the language completely. But usually what we're talking about when we do JavaScript is to interact with uh, HTML page. Not necessarily. There are other things to do today with JavaScript. There are even uh, web servers which are JavaScript-based, like Node.js. And there are many other things, but in the base concept of what most people would do with JavaScript is interact with HTML. So it's what the concept called DHTML. When I was starting with web, that was about 1998 or something, <coughs> the, the term DHTML came out and it was very hyped. It was very a hot topic. Every uh, wanted ads, every HR was looking for a DHTML expert without knowing what DHTML is. But DHTML is something that doesn't exist. It's a term that doesn't exist. So HTML is the language that we build web pages with, hypertext markup language. And DHTML is the connection with HTML, the web page, and some dynamic stuff that you can do. So you can take DHTML as HTML plus CSS. CSS is the styling that we put to the page. But CSS has also evolved quite a lot. And HTML also evolved, evolved quite a lot. Uh, so 
these things can be quite robust and you can do a lot with HTML and CSS without writing a single line of code. You can build animations and you can build all kinds of uh, mouse interactions and interactivity without writing a single line of code, only using HTML if you're using, like, let's say, HTML5. And CSS, if you're using CSS3, you can not just style the fonts and the colors and whatever, you can actually build things that really work and interact if the browser supports it, of course. But JavaScript adds a layer of programming, and it's a programming language, despite what people say. <coughs> so connect all these together, and you get an interactive uh, experience of interacting with the HTML, manipulating it, doing stuff. You have actually logic, you have code in your web page, and that's what we call dynamic HTML. So just like I said, we have the HTML, which is the website structure, the content, the semantic, the tags, the navigation, where you put buttons, where you put areas that you want to style. You have the CSS, which is the cascading style sheet that defines styles that you put to your page, colors, fonts. Uh, like I said, you can do a lot more today with CSS, you know, rounded corners, animated stuff. And on top of that, you have JavaScript, which adds behavior and it adds programming logic to your page. So if you need to do something on the client side, meaning that the browser and the user will do something together, then you put JavaScript to, to glue these things together. Uh, okay, we'll talk a little bit more about what, what, uh, what JavaScript is, and I think the next slide, am I right? Yeah, okay. So, um, so JavaScript, like I said, is a front-end language. Um, Yes, it's front-end, it's considered to be lightweight, it's considered to be like uh, the Wild West. You can do a lot of things that you cannot do with other languages because it's much more typeless and type-free. It's not exactly, and today we're going to talk about types and variables and we'll see some deeper things with them. And it's not completely typeless like people say, but it's not strongly typed. And you can do many changes while you work with variables and with memory allocations that you cannot do so easily with other languages. Um, <clears throat> it's considered to be lightweight, and it's considered to be, uh, it's usually run in the browser, which means it gets interpreted and run while the page is loading. It's not being compiled to, an to a, a binary file and assembly and then executed. So it runs in the client side. It's relatively considered simple. It's becoming much less simple. And I think that after we're going to finish this um, section of training, uh, I'm going to try to find time out of the Cosmos project to work on TypeScript and also about um, AngularJS and then you'll see how things get really, really interesting. The shit hits the fan. So it's, but until you reach that point, JavaScript is nice, simple, lightweight, easy, and whatever. Uh, it started in uh, 1995 as a language called Mocha. Um, and since at these times in the middle of the 90s, Java was completely a hyped up word and everything had to be Java and Java and people didn't even know what Java was, but uh, it was really a big hype around Java. So as a marketing uh, move, they changed the name to JavaScript. It had nothing to do with Java, and, uh, but the name was supposed to be catchy and nice and people would have to be attracted to it because it's something to do with Java. And then after they start learning, they'll see that they are actually screwed because it's not Java. <coughs> So that was the trick. Um, then uh, it was submitted to the ECMA, which is the European Computer Manufacturers Association. It's an organization that works on standardization of different uh, um, web-related things. And they, they actually tagged it as ECMA script. And you'll see many times when you look at documentation of JavaScript or if people talk about JavaScript, actually we're talking about this thing, ECMA script, sometimes referred to as ES and you'll see that a lot. And basically, JavaScript is still the marketing name of the language, but ECMAScript is the name of the standard. And it started developing and evolving, and there are a few versions of ECMAScript. You can see that um, ES3 was basically the most widely adopted by most used browsers in around 1999 and so on. Uh, ES4 was abandoned. Then we had ES5 and ES6, which are interchangeably the most used standards today. And we have ES7, which is evolving. It's not yet out. Um, but 
the problem with this is that JavaScript is everywhere. If you build an assembly, if you build a binary file, you write something with C sharp and you build it into a binary file, it can run on Windows and that's what you know. JavaScript runs in browsers and there are many browsers and every browser has a different engine to interpret the language. So we have different browsers implementing different features of the language and different engines doing different stuff and supporting different features of different standards of JavaScript. So you'll have a browser which uh, takes some features of VS6 and a browser that takes some, some features of VS5. And of course, Inter Internet Explorer has their own implementation. Uh, and that's a problem. That's a problem because uh, developers who work with JavaScript usually will have to take into account different browsers, different engines, and different features, and different uh, browser versions. And when you write code like this, um, it can really, you can really lose your mind and it's really, there are different tables showing which browser supports which features of which ECMAScript language version and it's, it's a mess. But just so you know, um, that's part of the reasons that we have, for example, uh, libraries and frameworks that make life easier. For example, jQuery is supposed to be uh, a library that works on most modern browsers the same way or you have um, libraries like Modernizer that take um, new features of JavaScript to be able to run them and you just leave your code as it is and you have the Modernizer li um, library that allows you to run new features um, of HTML5, CSS3 and I think also of JavaScript on older browsers because it's, it's a mess and if you build something you would never know how it's going to be like and if you're a web developer you have to test your web on different browsers to see how they react. And that's what it looks like today. <coughs> it's a par uh, it's a well a partial slide that I prepared <coughs> about a week ago, and it's just this is very partial. There are many, many, many frameworks libraries today. It's completely blasting. We have Angular, of course, that everybody knows about. But if you start learning Angular one, it's completely dead because everybody moved to Angular two. And if you start learning Angular two, they'll say, ah, oh, everybody already moved to React, and just forget it. And it's a mess. And we have all kinds of testing libraries like PhantomJS, and we have the um, Node.js, which is actually server-side technology. It's all about JavaScript, extensions of JavaScript, and takes off of JavaScript of all kinds, and libraries and frameworks. So good luck to you. Um, this guy is Scott Hanselman. He's a, a famous uh, Microsoft uh, evangelist. I was lucky to see him live in a few uh, conferences and this is the sad truth um, of how hiring a JavaScript developer looks like today. So every week there is a new framework coming out and of course people want to hire a developer with five years experience. Uh, so what can JavaScript do? basically interact with your page and do anything you want with it. It can, um, it can collect events, it can catch on events like mouse clicks or mouse over and it can interact with them and you can give, build your functionality around this. It can um, validate your um, web form. So before you actually send something to the server or before you do anything or while you do anything or while the user is typing, it can, um, you can implement, for example, validation. I think I have a few nice examples of this. Um, yeah, well, dynamically, pretty much whatever it says here, dynamically show and hide pieces of the page, animate things, calculate. There's a lot of uh, mathematics and calculation if you want to build something that actually does, does something. And AJAX functionality, which is the part of JavaScript that can send requests to the server. Is it, am I clear? Am I talking too fast or too slow or so far what I'm saying is clear to you? Yeah? So like I said, it can handle events, it can validate your phone. I think it's all repeating. So I'll say it again, handle your phones, cancel events, blah, 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 send requests, handle exceptions. Sorry? I will never delete. And like I mentioned, on top of the different versions of JavaScript which are evolving with different features and different uh, uh, support of ECMAScript, and, and by the way, Microsoft in the beginning didn't want to have JavaScript. They were using 
VBScript, God forbid, and on top of that, they wanted to do something like JavaScript, but they couldn't use the name JavaScript, so they, made, they named it JScript, which is JavaScript, but with a, a different name because they have to be special. And on, on top of that, different, um, there are different standards of uh, um, web browser engines that implement, um, again, different features of JavaScript and different browsers. So we have uh, the spider monkey, which is the um, engine that runs inside uh, Mozilla browsers. And we have V8, which is running inside Chrome. And we have Chakra, which is running inside Internet Explorer. Um, and we have a different engine in Safari. So again, every company implements its own flavor of JavaScript, supporting different features of different JavaScript um, features. Um, while the browser runs, the engine actually loads the script and starts executing it. Um, that allows you most, in most cases also to um, attach to debug tools so you can debug while your script is running, you can see what's happening. <coughs> and basically supports the script because the script doesn't run independently on Windows. The script knows the, it runs in the context of the browser. So everything that the script knows about memory management, about variables, about interaction with objects comes from the context of the browser. And that's what the browser engine actually provides, the runtime environment for your script and the debug time environment for your script. And I don't remember what's in this link, but let's see. But probably if I put it here, it's important. It doesn't mean you're, no. Yeah, no, you're not. Yeah. OK, there should be a, yeah, OK. Forget it, nothing, inter nothing interesting. You're, it's for idiots, but you're not, obviously, so, so you don't need this link. Okay, let's start with the first demo. Um, we're uh, we're going to see some things like this, some slides which have some code, and I can explain them, and then we're going to open them, and we're going to see them running. So, of course, the first thing we're, we're going to see is hello world, and the first thing we're going to call is the alert function that actually pops up a little alert window and shows it running. Um, what we can see here already is how things embed into the HTML page. Ah, no, it's not. Hey, what's up? <coughs> so, OK. So this is an HTML page, a standard HTML. It starts with the directive of doc type HTML. So it could be HTML5. And we have some tags. And inside the tags, we can put a tag of script. When everything that comes between the tags script and script is going to be executable code for JavaScript. And what we see here is a method called alert. It's a global function that pops up this message. It's all, you know this, right? Or partially, or not. So I think, uh, let's open this in Visual Studio. It'll be easier to see, maybe. Of course, Visual Studio is one of the environments you can use to build your scripts. It gives you um, highlighting of your syntax and IntelliSense and everything you need. And also, I'll show you how you can actually debug v uh, JavaScript through Visual Studio if you don't know it already. So again, this is what the source, uh, the code looks like. We have the body of our page, and inside it we have a script that starts and ends. Uh, this is, uh, by default, will be JavaScript, but of course you cannot 100% know that the browser that will run this will actually treat it as JavaScript. So the right thing to do here is to put uh, a type attribute and to say this is text slash JavaScript. If you want to be really correct, you can do language equals JavaScript as well. And when we open this in the browser, 
we'll see actually that uh, no. Yeah, we'll see the page is actually empty, and we this is our pop-up, which of course looks different if we open it in different browsers. The pop-up will look different because everything has to be different. Okay. Oh, oh no. Okay, so like I explained, we have the script tags. So everything in the script tags it will be considered as JavaScript. There are ways to exploit this, and there are some ways to inject bad JavaScript to your page, and there are ways to avoid this. We'll discuss it later in later sessions. Um, you can also use external files. So you can see here that uh, actually we have script and then attribute of saying uh, type equals text JavaScript, and we have a source attribute here that says that we're taking the file from an external source. So instead of writing your old code into your uh, HTML file, you can use um, source equals, and then you'll put the script somewhere else and it will open. Of course, it's much more recommended to use it like this, not to put your JavaScript code inside your HTML, but to separate your modules and put scripts in a separate place, and that's not, not embedded in your HTML, of course. And JavaScript files are... Uh, yeah, they're cached by the browser, so there is a client cache, and many times when you refresh, you will have to clear the cache if you make changes, or you have to instruct your browser every time to take a new version from the server so that if you make changes, you will see them affected. Um, JavaScript is executed when the, once the page gets loaded. So uh, like we saw now, we had the body, and inside the body we had a script block. So when the page starts loading, the JavaScript starts running um, during the load. Um, we can have some statements of JavaScript that will run only after the page finished loading, but basically it gets interpreted at, as the page um, as the page loads, and many times there, there are no checks, and like it says here, no compile checks, and many times when you have a, a bug or some, some error in your JavaScript, it will just get cut during runtime, and your browser will show an error, or the console will show an error. We'll see maybe that. Um, another example that we see here is that JavaScript can also execute on certain events. So here we have an image, and when the user click the image, then we're calling the, again, the alert method that will pop up the alert. So the JavaScript will be um, loaded when the page loads, but this will not happen until the user comes and clicks, handling the click event. So again, simple demo. Um, this time, the JavaScript has moved to the head tags. That's better because all the scripts load first before the body starts loading. Um, and we have a function called test. We'll see about functions later. And again, the function calls uh, the alert method with a message that actually passes as uh, an argument. And here in the body, we have an image and we have an on-click um, attribute. And when the user comes and clicks, we have a pop-up showing. So we can see it live, not this one, hmm. we can't, unless I copy and paste the code. So yeah, we just saw this on the slide, so I'm not going to show it again. I'm just going to go to my browser and re reload the page. Of course, the image is broken, great. But when I click it, we get the event handler. And thank God we didn't get back to the beginning again. So external scripts, like I mentioned, um, can be um, coming from external files. So for example, we have a file called sample.js here in this slide down here, and it has a function. The file JS should not have any directives or any tags or anything, just plain JavaScript code. So for example, this one contains um, this function. And instead of writing the code in my HTML file, which is the file on top, I'm just putting a script. 
and inside it I'm putting the SRC which directs to the JavaScript file and after I do this I can actually call the methods from my JavaScript file even though they're not inside this file. Let's see if I have it here. Maybe. Why is everything looking like this? Okay. I think we have no choice but to look at the code. Okay. So let's take a look at what's happening here. We have our head, we have our title, here we have a script. And notice this, uh, we have a source, that's a way of taking the file from an external source. But inside this source, we have a call to an alert. And this alert does not execute. So we, when the page loads, it doesn't automatically show this alert. Um, the reason is that once you have external source, everything else gets ignored. So the page loads, this ignores this code here, takes all the code from this file, which is now available. So you can see that the image here has an on click and it's called the method ninja clicked. So when I click the image, a method is called, but this method is not defined in this file. So if we take a look at script. Hmm? You need to have single source. Didn't get this. Yeah, you can have as many as you want. Uh, no, you mean in one tag you can have one, one source. But you can have multiple script tags. You cannot include more than one script source attribute. Uh, Hmm? Per tag, yeah. So here is the external JS file, and it contains these functions. So you can see that this function, ninja clicked, actually does two things. It writes to the console and also push, pushes an alert. We'll see the console in a sec. And also there is uh, another event handler that when we have a dropdown and when this dropdown changes, it takes the currently selected value and shows it in an alert. Also, you can see that there is no uh, semicolon here. That's because semicolons are not, ext not really needed in JavaScript. So um, you should know that. Line breaks are enough, unless you're writing a minified code. Um, but we'll talk about these things later. So here we have an image. Then we have a label, which is completely useless for the example. And then we have a select box with a few options. And when this select box is changing, we're calling the gender change. When the image is clicked, then we're calling the on click. These functions are not in this file. They're in the external files. And this code is uh, redundant. So again, to the browser, clicking the image. Um, I'm going to open for one second. We're going to see this in more detail later. But I'm going to open with F12 the developer tools of Chrome. All the browsers now have these developer tools embedded in them, including Internet Explorer. It used to be an add-on, now it's an integral part. And what we have here is the console. Um, you can write messages to the console, we'll see it a bit later, but I want to show that every time I click this image, except uh, popping up the alert, it also writes to the console. So here's the alert, and here is the console. Um, we'll see how you can write to the console all kinds of messages, and you can debug. Uh, what actually it um, what it actually points to the uh, printed to the console is the object that started this um, click event, which is the window um, element, and we can see all its properties. Whenever I change um, my select box. There's another event that gets triggered, and we get the value of what's selected in the box popping up. So like I explained, this uh, tag script should be empty. Otherwise, your code in it will be ignored. Hmm? 
Finishing? Yeah, the tag has a closing tag, yes. It's one of the tags that actually uh, needs a closing tag. Uh, this is some, this is some uh, frame from some movie, um, some trash movie called Goodbye World, and it has some JavaScript, JavaScript code on the screen, because, I don't know, they were trying to hack something, and they always show some funny stuff in fake, trashy hacker films. But this was a good example. Uh, about the syntax, we're going to get into each one of these things uh, one by one later, but um, it's quite similar to C sharp. It's not exactly, there are some differences, but many elements are close. Um, also taking, basically, originally the elements were taken from Java, and Java and C sharp are, mm, how do you say, uh, step brothers. Yeah, the evil twins. Um, so they are not completely similar, but they have many similarities in syntax, and JavaScript took this into it as well. Um, so if you, if you are familiar with uh, C sharp syntax, it will be easier for you to get into JavaScript syntax. Uh, these operators are uh, pretty much similar to their usage in, in C sharp, for example. Uh, variables are typeless, but they're not really typeless, and we're going to get into this later. Um, conditional statements, loops, of course you can build recursions, you have arrays, you can build object functions, um, and you can build your object-oriented, but that's a bit more tricky with JavaScript, but we'll see this later. Um, for th Yeah, the last point here, by the way, um, function variables. So it's much, much simpler than what you're used to with C Sharp. You can just take a function and use it as a variable, you can use it as an object, you can pass it on to another function, you can pass it between different variables and execute it. It's, it's just the Wild West. So uh, we've seen the alert box, and there are other ways to pop up some boxes. So alert just pops up a message, and uh, some developers use it for debugging their code. That's a very bad option, but unless, sometimes you have no choice. Um, so whenever you need something to pop up and show some text, this, is, this can work. Um, there's also a confirmation box that uh, says OK and cancel. So you can also present it to the user in some cases. And you can use a prompt box that actually reads data from the user in a text box. Um, these are the main three. Of course, you can build your own dialogues, and they will look like you want them to look, because these, of course, look different in every browser, um, even though they're actually supported by all browsers, because they're such basic, basic elements of the language. the text and the uh, default value. Uh, when you do prompt, it actually shows you a box that asks you to put an input, and there's a text box, and this will be the default value in the text box. You want to see it, or you, you'll pass? You believe me? No? no? Well, okay. you're going to have to trust me on this one. Other stuff that uh, everything we'll be seeing later, but uh, there are other uh, elements that you can interact with with your JavaScript, um, which are actually, like I explained, they're in the browser context. So the browser gives you your development context, and you can interact with it. And it has a few global objects that are always there, and you can always interact with them. The window, um, which is actually our topmost um, window, um, the browser window itself. Um, the document, which is the topmost, um, we'll talk about document hierarchy and the objects in the document, but the document is the top level of your HTML page. Um, the screen, so display properties, like you can get the screen resolution and other elements, so you can make your page behave properly in different um, screen configurations. And the browser that gives you information about the browser itself. Like, so when you write your code, Basically, you can know information about um, what's the size of the, what's the resolution of the screen and the size of the browser window and um, document element and other information, and you can make your page behave um, accordingly. Um, since this has become such a hot field as well, because everything now goes mobile, and your page has to be behave differently on um, 
computer monitors and has to behave different, differently on um, phones and on tablets, on different screen, screen sizes. Um, there's a whole um, design area called um, responsive design. Uh, most of it is already covered today with CSS, so you don't have to write scripts. You can write CSS that will adjust to your page as it changes. Um, maybe I have a demo of this, maybe not. But if you need your page to have some logic according to these things, you can actually get them at runtime and you can interact with them and you can see and you can write your code accordingly. The DOM um, or the document object model, I think, um, is the hierarchy of objects inside your window. Um, so we have the window, we have information about the, navig the navigator, which is the browser, we have the location, uh, which is currently the page, the address of the page, and we have the document element, which we can interact with all the objects in your page. You can start um, traversing the page from the topmost level to throughout all the containers and text boxes and buttons and you can interact with each one of them and all this information is available for you as, as, as developers who are writing JavaScript in the context of a browser. Actually, I can do this. Yeah. Um, so for example, we have here an, uh, another alert box. So we can see the window and the navigator object inside the window and the user agent, which gives us information about the, the current browser. So you can see the version and all kinds of runtime information about the browser. Sometimes it's valuable if you want to the user to, to see something in different browsers to see it differently. Mm. Yeah, I'm not going to get into the user agent strings. Um, because it's not relevant, but I'm going to share this presentation and you can see that there's a link again that I put here if you really want to get into what user agents mean and um, how they relate to different browsers. Unless you want to take a look now. But yeah. Okay. 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 So here's an example of interacting with a window. Um, you can um, move the window according to the screen. Um, you can, so this one, for example, um, what it does, it will take the window object. The window is a global object in JavaScript that's always there available to you if you're using a browser. And it will move it to 0, 0, which is the top left corner of the screen. Then it will get the screen available width, which is the screen resolution and the screen available height and it will resize it. Basically what it will do, it will maximize the browser window. It's not really maximize, because it's not maximized, but it will um, simulate max maximizing. Put it on the maximum size of the, of the screen. Just an example code. Yeah. Um, the document object, the document element, as I mentioned, gives you access to your um, document, all, to your HTML elements. So you can um, interact with them, you can read them, you can modify them, you can change the entire structure of a page at runtime, you can add elements to the page or remove them, hide them, change properties. Um, so for example, we have a collection in the document called links. It's uh, actually an array of all the links on the page. And we can change the first link in the array, if there are, if there is one, because otherwise it will be a runtime error. And we can go to the href, uh, which is the link address, and change it. Or we can go to the entire document, which is the whole document window in which uh, the browser is loading, and we can do a document write, which will change the entire document content to this text, or actually HTML. Is there a whole HTML for this? Yes. Whatever you have in your page, if you do document write, let me show you. Or well, let me try to show you. Yeah, because, um, so here's a, a loaded page. And what I'm uh, using now is the console of the developer tools, which basically allows you to run at, run at real time um, whatever statement you want or check whatever you want. 
So for, for example, if I type document, I can see the document object with all its underneath uh, stuff. So let's say document right. So everything that was on the page right now was replaced with this. Um, so you should be careful with document write. It's not common to use document write. Actually, once I used document write because I had a terrible application and it was uh, loading in different frames and it was awful. And I had to break out of these frames and everything was protected. So I wrote a script that will take all the frames and just read all their data into some variables and then do a document write of everything into the main window and just break the hell out of the frames and it worked. But that was a dirty, dirty, dirty hack and it was the first and only time that I actually used document write in my JavaScript code. But it works. So if you need dirty hacks, you know where to find me. Yeah, uh, for example, document.location is the address that is currently loaded in the browser, so you can also change it. So if you do document.location, it will redirect you to another address through the browser, going to the document location property and redirect. There are other ways to redirect, of course, but we'll not talk about them now. <coughs> do we have a demo? Ah, we have a demo for the pop-up boxes because you didn't believe me. So I'm going to show it. Um, just before we continue back to the pop-up to the browser objects, I want to show this quick demo because I just remembered it's here. Um, so what we can see is again a simple HTML page and script. And first thing, we're calling the confirm dialog that says, are you sure? This gets into a variable here that's called answer. Uh, by the way, this is an intro. And everything you see here, since you are not all developers or this, I'm gonna, we're going to see in detail later. So I'm just jumping into functions and variables and how they work. But we're going to see a deeper look into those later um, in later sessions as well. So first, we are getting a confirmation box by calling confirm. This will put a Boolean variable into the answer. Then if this answer is true or anything, there are many, many things related to true and false. We'll see those later as well. If it's something that's equivalent to true or sufficiently true, let's say, then we're putting a prompt dialog, which has a text and a default value, like I said. And this takes the user input, puts it to the age and then pops up an alert. So we have three different pop-ups here, which are sequentially loaded. So let's just see this quickly. So here's the first confirmation dialog. Uh, do you want to continue? OK and cancel. I don't think cancel is the opposite of OK, but that's, that's a standard. And let's say I say OK, then I get the prompt dialog. So I got the text and default value in the text box. So let's put something and OK. Then we get an alert, which takes the variable and puts it in the text and shows it. And about the built-in objects that we just saw, let's take a quick look. So there are a few functions here, for example, opening a window. So this one will use the window.open method that will just open another browser window. And you can manipulate this with different variables, um, how it will behave, how it will look. And you can build all kinds of pop-up boxes because users love pop-ups. They just love them. So the more pop-ups you build, the, the more popular you'll be. That's why they're called pop-ups. Yeah. They would, they, they're, they're just playing with you. 
So we have a window, and this actually the window open returns us a variable of type uh, of another window, and we can manipulate that. So we can, for example, go to the new window and the document, and we can write into this window. And that's one way to just take data and type it uh, and transfer it to a pop-up window. This one will um, put a whole HTML into the page, and also put the navigation user agent string, which again I don't want to show you this article because it's really really secret and and not interesting, but if you want to learn about navigation, uh, user agent strings, that will be the place for you. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to look at the body here. So we have two links. Um, and I'm not going to get into HTML, but this is a, a link, href, uh, which leads to nowhere. Um, not exactly. We'll talk about Angular and hashtags, but that's not our, not our thing today. Um, when we click the first link, it will call the open new window function that we just saw here. And the second link, what it will do, it will change the body color. So it, uh, it's another method, which is defined up here. It will calculate red, green, blue, and it will combine them into a color code, a hexadecimal color code, and set the document.body.style.background color to the new color. And get color part is another function here that is called here that does um, random number generation between 0 and 2056 and generates and changes it into hexadecimal code and adds a, a leading zero. You don't, need, you don't need to know this right now, but, um, but if you want, that's what it's doing. So let's take a look at this. So the first one is interacting with the window by opening a new window object. And hopefully, I don't have a pop-up blocker. OK. Or maybe I do. Um, and this is the string that I talked about, the user agent string. There is a title here. And there is no status bar, because Chrome are smart. And we don't need it. Um, the other link um, changes the body color. So every time I click, it will generate uh, random color and we'll change that's hours of fun um, okay that's clear right so far too fast no but this is just the intro so everything I'm saying now we'll get into more details later uh, mathematical object, there's a mathematical, uh, a global math which provides different mathematical functions that are sometimes useful. And we'll see other ways that you can use different manipulations on math. And we'll talk about numbers and how man numbers are actually built in JavaScript and how they're um, supposed to be, man how you can manipulate them in different ways. And actually also the math, things like this, for example, math, which is a global library with different functions of JavaScript is different between uh, ECMAScript versions of JavaScript. So ES6 has new features that ES5 didn't have, for example. Um, so this also helps. You have to take into account. But these functions that you see here, like random and floor, they're, um, they're everywhere, old enough. So uh, this is another example of a global object that is available, available to us when we're using JavaScript in the browser context. Date, another uh, global object. Of course, one more thing I want to add about this. These global objects are there, and you can use them. But what you can also do is change them. And you can add more functionality into the built-in objects if you really want by changing their prototype. Not going to get into this now but just just mentioning it so for example date object is giving us an option to um, read the current date and gives us uh, information uh, basically it's a date manipulation if you need to add uh, subtract uh, build some manipulation of date time um, time zones uh, time spans date spans something like that. so whatever you need in terms of date time the date object is your friend Timers are also widely used. Again, you can build uh, different animations without using timers already, because they are built into HTML and CSS. But you can set up timers. Um, 
for, for different types. So uh, again, uh, this is one option. Um, one example of using timers um, is to set a timeout, and this will be happening only once. So what will happen in, when we're running this function, um, it will wait 5,000 milliseconds, which is five seconds, and then call a method. Um, it will also return a timer object that we can then reset if you want to be uh, correct and run this again. So this is one option of running timers, set timeout. Okay. And there is also the set interval, which um, will do a repetitive action. So this, for example, will call a method every second. And if you want to stop this, you have to call the clear timeout to stop the timer from counting endlessly. These are just examples of what you can do, I think. So we've seen all the built-in objects, but the timer ones we haven't. Okay, so ignore the styling here and ignore. Um, okay, here is our. Hmm. Let me just take a quick look. Okay, so. Uh, okay, it's a simple. Uh, yeah. Sorry for the recap. It's a simple clock, uh, clock uh, function. So uh, when we start the timer, um, we are calling mm, this function that will give us an uh, interval of one second, and every time we'll call the set time function. Once we call the set time function, we're actually going to print out the current time by getting the date object and manipulating it into a nice string. So then we're going to go into the timer element in the HTML and print out the time nicely and this will repeat itself every second it's just mm, a little big to, to remember it all the functionality here but it's really really simple so these don't look like links because there's a lot of styling on this page but they are so if I click one you can see a clock running and every second updating the current time and stop will clear the interval and the timer will stop. Um, this one. Okay, about debugging, uh, there are a few options for debugging and I'm going to show you some of them right now. Um, debugging is of course really important for everybody who writes code and I don't think it's possible to, to do anything without debugging. Um, so, first of all, like I mentioned, when you have, <coughs> um, when you have, mm, most of the browsers have their own um, JavaScript debuggers built into them. You can find them in the F12 dev tools. Um, there are also external debuggers, and I'm also going to show how we can debug with Visual Studio right now. Um, and also how to debug with uh, the um, dev tools um, to avoid all kinds of errors. And like I mentioned, errors can differ between browsers and runtime engines and support for different features. And sometimes you're using a feature which is not suppo supported by the browser and you can run into an error which you didn't uh, mean. Um, there's also the console that you can write uh, stuff to and you can also pop up alerts. So all these tools can help you debug your JavaScript get runtime notifications at different, uh, different times. Um, so I, I'm going to show this. Well, Firebug uh, is not relevant for us because we are KPMG and we don't use Firefox, but I'm going to maybe show it. I think I have it installed. If not, I'm going to install it. Um, Firebug is a powerful tool add-on for Firefox. Actually, most of the functionality is already supported with the Firefox built-in um, user uh, dev tools, which is also supported by other tools like Internet Explorer dev tools and Chrome dev tools. But uh, it's, again, a, a powerful add-on for um, Firefox. Um, the console object is also another option for you to, to throw your uh, debug information. So you can 
um, write debug at different levels. So if you have an error, you can write an error message by calling the console.error, or if you have some um, info, you can write console.info. So at your runtime, you can interact with this console. The user usually doesn't, doesn't see the console, but you as developers of the script, you can actually see what's the output there. And you can also use it at runtime, like I showed you now with the uh, document write, and see what happens when you make changes. So the console is, uh, is pretty powerful also when you want to check something after your page is loaded. Uh, <clears throat> these things I'll show you after what I show you now. Yes. What I wanted to show. Um, let's take a look at this file first. Okay. I'm going to uh, show a few options of debugging right now. So, uh, what we see here is that we are using three different console functions. Um, console.log, console.warn and console.error and what we have here can you see it maybe better now so we have here a loop that counts from 0 to 9 basically 10 iterations and every time we're checking if the number is um, leaves no remainder when you divide by 3 and then when it leaves 1 and otherwise so Every time we pass through a number in the iteration, our counter is checked. If it can divide by three, if it can divide by three with um, one remainder or with two remainders. So every time it will get into a different if statement. This is irrelevant for you now. What's relevant is that every time we count, we're putting a different console message to the log, a different type of console message. So otherwise this script does nothing and uh, this page is pretty empty. So if we open it in the browser, you'll see nothing. Yeah, it's a blank page. But if we open the console by clicking F12, we can see the console messages. So this is the console. I clicked F12 to open my DevTools. So the first, we can see all the counters because basically what it does, sorry for anybody who's epileptic. Um, so uh, basically what it does, it prints the counter to the log, to the console but every time in a different type of message. And if we go back here, this is the console when the page loaded. So we can see first it typed as a message, then types as an info, and then types as an error. So you can see that they are differently um, classed, classified. And here we can also get some information, which is the calling function and where was it called from. If we click here, we'll see exactly where this error occurred. It's not really an error, it's an error that we reported. Uh, one more thing, uh, the debug tools here, I mean the console dev tools also give you an option to debug right from the browser. So I can basically put a breakpoint here and when my page loads, if I reload it, we are now paused in the debugger and what we got here is a full debug environment. We can go over. So uh, what I want to show is that I actually can debug here and I can go state in my statement, hopefully not to kill the recorder again. And uh, while I do this, I have the call stack so I can see which function called which function. I have uh, my local variables. It's just a little bit. Mm. We have all the global objects that we can put our own watches here. So if you want to inspect some uh, variable yourself, you can put it here and see what its value at runtime and you can see how it evolves. And if you put the mouse also, you'll get hopefully some information yep. about everything. So that's one option for debugging. Uh, the other option is to write to the console like I showed you here. So you can write different messages to the console. Um, Another popular option is, of course, to use Visual Studio, uh, but you can't just use it like this. Um, Visual Studio allows you to uh, debug your project if it's a web project. So I'm uh, just going to put the, create a new SP.NET web application just as a demo. 
uh, an empty one for now. So this will create a structure of a simple uh, ASP.NET website. Are you winning? Yeah, yeah. So here I'm going to add an HTML page. And to my HTML page, I'm going to add a script. Now, uh, uh, in order to debug this, you have to make sure that your project runs in Internet Explorer. Otherwise, um, only this is the supported browser for immediate debugging out of Visual Studio. So if I choose Internet Explorer here, I can basically put a breakpoint and I can just start, start it like this. Now the page should load and I'm in the breakpoint. Um, just as simple as that. If you don't put breakpoints, one option, one additional option is to use the debugger statement, which should theoretically uh, put you into the debugger without actually setting breakpoints into your code. Doesn't work. Hmm? Oh. Let's try this again. Okay, I'm not sure why it didn't throw me there, but maybe it doesn't support debugger in this context. Let me try one more time thing. I think that will be almost our last thing here. So uh, what I did, uh, instead of using the debugger of Visual Studio, which I just showed you that if you open with Internet Explorer, will allow you to debug, um, but doesn't catch on the debug statement, I opened the uh, dev tools of my browser, which is Chrome, because Chrome is smart, and it knows how to do things right. And it actually, when I opened it and my source is open, I could just attach to the debugger with the debugger statement. So that's another option. If you know that there's a place in your code which is hard to reach and it's some internal function that's hard to find where exactly and how exactly to step into it, you can just put a debugger in your code and hopefully your browser will stop and will put you there when you need it. So that's also useful. Okay, and then the code continues. Um, so much for this. Before we take a break, uh, I want to show you two more things which are uh, cool and good to know. Um, these two common hacks and shortcuts, uh, they're not part of the original um, course demonstrations, but I think they're important to know, at least to be aware of them when we're talking about JavaScript. The first thing is bookmarklets that are useful. They have been useful more in the past, uh, but they're still cool to, ha to know about. And uh, there is some automation related to JavaScript um, like Grease Monkey, but I don't, we cannot use Grease Monkey in our computers because we can't use Firefox and extensions. But I'll show you what it means just in a sec, a very quick demo. Because this also relates to the introduction level, I think. Yeah. That's good for you. So uh, uh, we'll talk maybe in the, in the future about this structure, but this is a very special structure of uh, a JavaScript function. It's called Yiffy. Uh, I forgot the, the abbreviation, but uh, a <coughs> um, nice guy called Douglas Crockford. He's one of the uh, developers of JavaScript it itself. Um, and one of the people who came out with this uh, pattern, he, called it, he calls it dog balls because it's it's like these things hanging out in this, this parenthesis. But this structure is a self-contained function that you can define, and it will execute itself immediately. Theoretically, what, what happens is that if you put in the browser's URL 
something like this. It will run your script. And what you can do is take a link which will have this source code. So this is what it looks like. When I click this link, it will, of course, run it. What I can also do is take this link and put it as a bookmark. And that's why it's called bookmarklet. And when I click it, it will actually execute the code. Why is it good for? For different ver reasons. Um, you can see that I have a few bookmarklets here that I've made myself. Uh, for example, this one. This is the code of this bookmarklet. It's all one statement, one big function. And if I take it here and put it here, it can be used for many different uh, uh, usages. For, for example, if I go to YouTube and I play something. Whoa, another light. Um, this bookmarklet will pop up the currently running video. And I'll have a separate window so I can use it in the background. So this is one thing that I wanted to show, is uh, this thing with bookmarklets, because sometimes it's useful. Um, it's another way of using JavaScript, and uh, I've used it a lot, and it's really cool sometimes. Um, the other thing I wanted to, take, uh, to talk about is uh, automation through uh, the extension called GreaseMonkey. It's this monkey here. It allows you to build JavaScripts and to inject them into your pages automatically. Um, for example, if we go to kpmg.com, So it loads the page, OK. But for example, if I want a specific automation which relates to kpmg.com, I've added here a script. Um, let's see the user scripts. So there's a script here that says make kpmg red. Um, you can see the script. There's some function here that actually loads the page. It loads the jQuery, and then it changes the background to red of most of the elements on the page. This can be used. I've used it a lot for automatically filling forms, for example. So if this uh, extension is active, uh, it loads the page, but it also loads my script automatically. And then it can apply changes. Now, furthermore, if you build such a script, like this one that I just showed you. Here's the source again. And you have Google Chrome. You go to the extensions of Google Chrome, not this one. Then basically what you can do is take your file and flip it into the extensions, and it will add it as an extension. So basically, these things work on the same extension type. So again, if I go to KPMG here, the extension will kick in. So that's the easiest way to build an extension with Google Chrome, with just a simple JavaScript. Uh, let's remove it. So here it's been added. here. I think that's what we have for the first part. Um, I think it was clear. Let's take a break, and we'll continue with some other stuff.